Hi everyone, this is our channel Around My Story. Please like, share and subscribe. Hi there, I'm Carl and I'm 19 years old. I live with my grandpa on his farm on the outskirts of the city. Grandpa is fond of nature and quietude, as these calm his soul and spirit. He loves cultivating flowers and is very skilled in this field. He reads numerous books on unusual species of flowers, including their planting and growing requirements. He can also extract perfume fragrances from flowers. At first, I didn't care about this hobby of his and viewed it as a waste of time. However, after talking with him many times at length and listening to his myriad descriptions of the beauty of nature and flowers, I became hooked on them myself. Now I am as passionate as he is about them, and I love to study and learn about exotic and rare flowers. One of Grandpa's friends happened to be a botanist. He could talk for hours about rare flowers, even imaginary ones depicted in science fiction movies. One evening after he had visited our home and left, we went into the kitchen to prepare dinner, when suddenly, there came a knock at our front door. I answered the door but no one was there, nothing save a small box with a card, which I dutifully carried to Grandpa. The card said simply, a gift from a dear friend. So we opened the box to find some strange seeds that were unlike any that Grandpa had ever seen before. He read another part of the note, this is a Yasni flower from the future. Get ready for a fantastical, unforgettable trip. We didn't really believe this silly message, but we decided, what the heck, let's plant them and see what happens. In just three days, the seeds had produced exotic looking purple flowers. Grandpa plucked one to extract some perfume from it. It had a wonderfully fragrant smell. Suddenly, I felt enervated and listless. My vision blurred, I couldn't breathe, and I became dizzy and passed out. When I opened my eyes, I was in the middle of some unknown desert. There were unfamiliar looking parked cars with people in unfamiliar looking clothes. One of the strangers pointed at me in alarm and shouted, Catch him! I ran but they surrounded me and caught me. They bound my hands and hung me from a horizontal tent frame. I heard a groan and looked to my left to see Grandpa similarly bound and hanging from another tent frame. The strangers were speaking in a language I had never heard before. Their apparent leader came over to us and said, See this desert? The entire world is like this. Because of you. You destroyed our world. Our future is dark and bleak now. Those Yasni flowers you planted ended up breeding out of control and destroyed the world. You need to pay for your foul deeds. Suddenly, I heard a gunshot. Someone had shot Grandpa in the chest. He was bleeding profusely and appeared to be unconscious or dead. I couldn't tell which. I screamed and then the shooter came towards me with hatred blazing in his eyes. He stopped and placed his gun barrel to my forehead. I screamed no and closed my eyes tightly. After a pause and hearing no shot, I opened my eyes to find myself lying on the floor beside Grandpa, the plucked flower lying between us. I woke him up and told him about my dream and found that he had had the exact same dream. He called his botanist friend and described the seeds, the flower, and its fragrance to him. The botanist said the unknown flower sounded similar to one that grew high in the Swiss Alps. It was illegal to import because it was known to induce hallucinations and cause other unpredictable reactions in people. To this day, we have no idea who the dear friend was that sent us these unusual hallucinogenic flowers. We figure it must have been someone's idea of a practical joke. Or were these Yasni flowers indeed sent to us from the future? Hello, my name is Adrian and I am 27 years old. I am an archaeologist and the leader of an archaeological team. We have recorded many archaeological discoveries and earned many honors in our country. We are renowned and popular with the media. Yet, in spite of all my achievements, I wasn't satisfied. My dream in life was to discover the hidden gold of King Pedro, the second king of Peru. He was reputed in many legends to have possessed a vast treasure of gold. However, there was no concrete evidence of this. For all I knew, it may have been just old wives' tales passed down through the generations. I was the only one I knew who took the legend seriously. King Pedro had been famous for his power and strength. The stories mentioned that he had many hidden underground treasures, so there was at least a chance that these stories and legends might be true. I started my journey by searching the internet for maps and data from any previous expeditions to Peru. I read their notes, logs, and experiences there. I found a lot of data but no solid information that I could hang my hat on. I didn't give up though. 
I invited a few trusted members of my team to accompany me on an expedition to Peru. A four-day trip saw us arrive at the South American forest, a heavily forested place, an ideal place for a king to hide his treasure. The forest was full of wild animals, and we were attacked several times. Every night, we would have insect bites all over our bodies. Still, I didn't lose hope in spite of these adversities. All evidence pointed to a place called the Tiger's Eye, somewhere in the middle of the forest. It was believed to be a lava tube or cave of some sort, with a lava flow that went deep into the earth. When we reached what we believed to be our destination, we were so tired. Yet, my enthusiasm and face drove me to want to go down into the hole immediately. My team warned me to exercise caution, but I was too excited too close to potentially achieving my life's dream. I rigged a rope and began lowering myself down into the hole. I quickly learned that this had been a mistake. The air in the hole was scalding hot. Sparks were rising with the hot air flow up and out of the hole. The rope started smoldering where small sparks in the stifling air uptake had clung to the rope, creating small burning embers. I began to worry that my rope might burn through and drop me into this hellhole. But right before I started to pull myself back up, I glimpsed something. Something shiny. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I saw flashes of gold tint embedded in the rock and glinting in the faint sunlight glow from above. I climbed out of the hole, soaking in sweat, sucking in the cool, refreshing air to expel the burning air from my lungs. I told my team about the veins of gold in the walls of the hole. We set up a camp for a few weeks and were able to extract a small fortune's worth of gold. It wasn't King Pedro's gold treasure, but it was close enough to make our expedition worthwhile. It was a great discovery in that my trip wasn't completely in vain. Can I call my dream a success? Taking responsibility is a great thing especially when you can see the result of your efforts in front of your eyes and when your family is so proud of you. But sometimes you are forced to hide your achievements to make your family happy. This is what I had to do. My name is Kareem. I'm 21 years old, and I would like to tell you my story. When I was 15, I lived with my mother and my little brother, Chris, in a small apartment in a neighborhood close to a hospital called Central Hospital. I was working in that hospital at this time. Chris was the most important person in my life because my father died when he was just two months old, causing him to become my responsibility. I had previously worked in grocery stores, clothing stores, and in an office as an office boy. Then one of my friends told me that Central Hospital had an opening for a doctor's assistant and that they would train the new hire for the job. Thus began my work as a nurse. I was a hard worker, so I became one of the top nurses in the hospital. But my dreams were bigger than this because I wanted my family to have a good standard of living. Unfortunately, my current low salary couldn't get us where I wanted us to be. One day, Gabriel, one of my colleagues at the hospital, called me. We didn't know each other well because we had only greeted each other in passing in the hallway. So we met and I sat down with him. He told me he had been watching me closely for a long time and he knew that I desired more money than what I was making and that this was what had prompted him to speak with me. He told me that he could help me earn a lot more money. I asked how, and he explained that some people need some stuff from the hospital, and we could help them get it. Medicine, you mean? I asked. Um, no, he answered. He shifted his position and moved his head closer to mine and whispered in a low voice, Some people with serious illnesses need replacement organs for organ transplant surgery. Others, who are healthier and more fortunate, are willing to sell their organs to help these poor, unfortunate people while making a profit for themselves at the same time. Are you talking about trading human organs, I posited? I was hesitant. Many thoughts raced through my mind. If these people died, there would always be more patients. Honesty and integrity in my work were essential to keep my job. I could get fired and even arrested for getting involved in such skullduggery. But I could make a lot of money. Much to my chagrin, my greed muted all other concerns, and I accepted his offer. 
Every day, Gabriel would ask me to obtain an organ. I would wait until midnight, then sneak into the morgue and steal an organ from a recently deceased patient and sell it to Gabriel for money. Our arrangement worked like a charm. I made loads of money. I moved my family into a new apartment, enrolled my brother in a better school, and saw joy and satisfaction in my family's eyes. Then one day, Gabriel asked me to get him a kidney for a patient with an urgent and serious condition. I searched the morgue but couldn't find an identical match for the patient's kidney profile. I noticed that a living patient, a man with a serious heart condition, happened to be a good kidney match for our needs, but Gabriel needed a replacement kidney in two days. What could I do? I told myself that this patient with the heart condition case would likely die sooner rather than later. So, why not end his suffering a little early? So, I called Gabriel and told him that he would get his kidney after midnight. I entered the patient's room and gave him an empty injection, basically causing an air embolism. A few minutes later, a nurse came in and found him dead. Once they moved his body to the morgue, I removed his kidney. I had unwittingly become the angel of death. I felt no remorse for my actions, though, until I met a patient named Catherine, who had developed a serious brain tumor. Her bad fortune made Gabriel ask for a new heart for a kid. So I made up my mind to end Catherine's suffering. It was for a good cause, after all, right? That night, I entered her room quietly with a hypodermic needle in my hand. I held her hand and looked at her beautiful, innocent face. She did not deserve death, I thought to myself. Suddenly she woke up and asked me what I was doing. I told her that I was going to end her suffering but she assured me that she most certainly did not want to die. I hesitated and thought about letting her live, but greed had firmly wrapped its icy steel fingers around my heart, and I gave her the injection with a steady hand. Just before she died, she said, You will pay for your heinous deeds. At that moment, I heard an ambulance's siren and ran to the window to see what was going on. It seems there had been a horrible accident. A truck had crashed into a school bus. I watched the paramedics carry in the dead bodies of the students involved in the accident. Suddenly, my throat constricted and my heart skipped a beat. One of the dead students they were carrying in was my own little brother, Chris. I felt as if a knife had been driven into my heart. Why did this happen to me? I hadn't done anything wrong. I was saving people's lives and stopping the suffering of others. I didn't deserve this punishment. I screamed his name aloud several times while people around me watched me scream. Not only did my brother die that day, but my mother subsequently fell ill and went into a coma. My sins had come back to haunt and taunt me. Catherine's dying words stuck in my mind. You will pay for your heinous deeds. How I wish I could apologize to those whose lives I had taken.